Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 78. Just a short bit of channel admin uh, this week and that is to announce that this coming Friday, that is the 31st in the evening, we're going to be running two events for uh, World of Warships players on the EU and NA servers, um, exact times and uh, who's going to be running them will be announced on the YouTube community tab later uh, in the week um, but that's going to be the monthly Mikasa Royal Rumble um, so if you have a Mikasa already um, clearly because you had one or because I gave one to you during the New Year's Mikasa Royal Rumble feel free to show up and if you don't have a Mikasa but you'd like to show up to the event and you need a Mikasa then drop me a line in Discord and we'll sort you out with a Mikasa um, and uh, then we shall have many entertaining secondary battery fights because that is the way of things. Um, and we might also, for 100k subs, we might also do a Dreadnought Royal Rumble at some point, maybe in February, but we'll see how that goes. Anyway, let's get on with the questions, which this week are taken from the video on the Victorian era cruiser HMS Blake. Uh, don't worry, uh, the, for, to the person who requested the Tiger class cruiser HMS Blake, it is coming um, later this year. And the rest of the questions, apart from the Patreon ones, obviously are taken from a whole medley of uh, revoiced videos that I put out that in that particular week. Uh, the Littorio class, the Lexington class, and the Danton class. So with all that said and done, let us begin with question the first. Kim Lee Christensen asks, if King George V and Rodney hadn't caught up to the Bismarck and Commander of Force H decided, well, enough waiting around for the home fleet, let's give Bismarck the stick, could repeated attacks by swordfish torpedo bombers throughout the day on the 27th of May have sunk the Bismarck? Now, it's an interesting one to ponder because Bismarck was close to getting under Luftwaffe air cover. So, albeit that it was effectively going in gigantic circles and limited about 8 to 12 knots by the dawn of the 27th of May, it, they've probably only got about the 27th or so before some form of protection, whether it's U-boats or Luftwaffe or whatever, finally manages to show up, assuming that Bismarck can still continue to make some vague direction towards um, France. Now, historically speaking, the Ark Royal did have... a uh, flights of swordfish up ready to attack Bismarck around the time that King George V and Rodney were shooting at it, um, but they didn't launch the attacks because, well, they would be flying into an active combat zone with uh, lots of shells flying all over the place and did the distinct possibility of some friendly fire incidents. And whilst Bismarck obviously didn't take too many hits compared to the number of swordfish that attacked it previously, both from Victorious and Ark Royal, it is something more of a sitting duck now compared to before when it was able to make a relatively decent speed and manoeuvre more freely. Now, given that she would effectively be crippled, that would mean Ark Royal could, if she wanted to, close to relatively close distance, especially for an aircraft carrier, and if effectively fly almost continuous strikes of flights of swordfish if she wanted to. Um, of again, so it's not going to be like a taxi rank system, but you'd have maybe strikes landing every five to ten minutes um, before they will have to cycle back. Now, in terms of sinking the ship, it's going to be relatively difficult because the ship's torpedo defense system is quite good, um, but it has already taken hits outside the torpedo defense system fore and aft. Uh, well, mostly aft, obviously. Um, now, there is a theoretical possibility that the ship could be sunk entirely by torpedoes. The two main things is going to be where the torpedoes hit and what damage Bismarck's anti-aircraft batteries managed to do, because, um, as was explained quite wonderfully by one of Military History Visualized videos, the swordfish that attacked Bismarck weren't not hit. They were. It just so happened that, well, when you're flying something that looks a little bit like a canvas and wood antique out of the First World War, um, all these wonderful 
uh, fuses on anti-aircraft shells that are designed to detonate when they hit something like a metal skinned airplane just go straight through and out the other side. So you basically poke a load of holes in it, but that doesn't really affect the ship, the uh, aircraft's flying capability all that much. Um, so it's possible with repeated strikes, assuming that the AA ammunition holds out uh, and the like, that Ark Royal's ability to launch strikes might be degraded through cumulative damage to various swordfish. So that's a possibility. It may be that Bismarck eventually somehow manages to fight fight them off just by attriting the swordfish out of the sky. Um, but in terms of the torpedo hits themselves, which we were talking about before, um, yes, there is a, a, a reasonable possibility in terms of um, can it be sunk, and that's because if enough damage can be done to the areas where the torpedo defense system isn't or is somewhat thinner i.e. fore and aft then that will allow more water in obviously and the ship will begin to settle now fair enough that may not be enough to sink the bismarck in and of itself because you've got the citadel theoretically remaining unbreached however this is where things start to get a bit more technical because once the ship starts to settle assuming that the swordfish don't all attack it on one side and and try and capsize it um, the same way that the US would later do to the Yamato um, and assuming that Bismarck doesn't try counter flooding or is able to counter flood which is a possibility either way um, but even assuming that torpedo hits are coming in from all sides and the ship is gradually settling at some point the ship will settle down to a point where the uh, torpedoes will begin to impact on the ship's armor rather than torpedo defense system and whilst you might think well hitting a 12 inch plus thick slab of steel ought to be relatively um, good at protecting the ship from incoming torpedo strikes a torpedo that hits n n um, either on the bottom of the ship's armor which is thinner um, or on the, the belt itself the impact is very different uh, because the armor can't go anywhere. The whole point of a torpedo defense system is it basically absorbs the impact, a bit like um, the uh, it, the crush zones on a modern car. But if, well, a big rigid armor belt takes the impact, it either breaks or doesn't. And uh, especially with the thinner plates on, at the lower end of the Bismarck's belt, at the which are joined onto the main torpedo protection system, um, these could well be cracked, broken, blown through, or dislodged by direct torpedo strikes. If that happens, then flooding comes in to the main hull of the ship above the torpedo defense system, and because of the turtle back armor, the ship's uh, actual citadel, the bit that's protected by the turtle back and the torpedo defense system, is actually somewhat lower in the water compared to. Um, other ships of the period where the main armor deck is much higher and that means at that point that even if the citadel remains unbreached you're going to get a lot of water pouring in above the citadel which in and of itself may add up to enough of a load on, on the ship just to sink it outright um, but potentially even worse with that flooding coming in above the citadel you've now got an awful lot of weight riding relatively high in the ship as far as the ship as a structure goes which would induce a pretty catastrophic list which would then cause the ship to roll over and sink um, because well you don't expect necessarily to be pumping water out of the top of the ship and so the pumps that are available in the upper part of a battleship are considerably less numerous and less powerful as opposed to the pumps that are available down in places like the engine room where you might expect to find um, water coming in from torpedo strikes and such so once that bit up top starts flooding then it's entirely possible the ship will will go down somewhat one way or another um, so yeah that theoretically possible and that's a bit of a long answer but there's a lot of factors one way or the other. Airplane Master 1 asks, could the concept of the armoured protected or unprotected cruiser be considered the last gasp of the Age of Sail era by still trying to fit as many guns as possible to each broadside, uh, just in turrets or casements instead of flat holes in the hull? Now, I can kind of see where you're coming from with that, but although the 
broadside battery, as it were, remains very much a thing um, in the sort of late Victorian era cruisers to the point that you could be excused when you look at something like, say, HMS Good Hope for thinking that's basically an armoured version of a ship of the line. Um, the reasons for positioning those guns as they did are actually not really anything to do with the, with the desire for a broadside and more to do with the practicalities of ship construction. Um, so in this case, this is uh, HMS Terrible. Um, uh, before it was fitted with most of its guns, but you can still see where the casements went. Um, now, the thing with the layout of guns, or especially on the cruisers of the period, was mainly actually dictated by the engine technology of the time. They understood the idea that centerline guns were superior in as much as it allowed you to effectively get a, a much broader field of fire than you would likely to get out of a casement or um, side-mounted uh, gun of some description. And it also allowed that gun, as well as having a greater field of fire, to effectively do the job of two guns um, because it could bear port and starboard. And in the case of guns uh, fore and aft, it could also cover that arc as well. So, whereas, you say, let's say with Terrible, you can see that the forward uh, casement between, perspective-wise at least, between funnels one and two, that would carry two six-inch guns, and then two on the other side, so you've got the weight of four six-inch guns, but you can only bring two of them to bear on either broadside. Whereas only two deck-mounted centerline guns could do the job of those four casement-mounted guns and also wouldn't need the weight of the casements. The restriction was, as I said, the engine technology, and that was because they were still on uh, vertical expansion engines of various natures during that period, single, double, triple, etc. These took up an awful lot more space than the later turbines would, um, and obviously with boiler technology also not being quite as efficient, you needed a lot more boilers. You needed awful, an awful lot more boilers, and you needed um, quite tall engines that intruded into a lot of the hull space. And you can kind of see in this picture where you've got the four funnels, you can see all that machinery space underneath it, plus a little bit more to the to the stern. And this ate up deck space, I mean, you've also see all the uh, air intakes there as well. So all of that space pretty much from the rear rear of the bridge, practically to the, the, the rear mast, that's all deck space that's taken up by engines and maybe the odd light gun that you can squeeze in there. And so they just, there just isn't the space to put um, deck-mounted centerline guns. The only place you can is fore and aft, and in the Terrible's case, this is where they uh, stuck a couple of big guns at each end in turrets. So they understood uh, the idea of uh, turret-mounted and, in earlier ships, barbette-mounted guns. Um, so this is why you get the broadside batteries, because that's the only meaningful way to get a decent... A ba secondary battery, or in the case of most of these cruisers, mixed main battery, actually in play. And if that involves a relatively inefficient um, broadside layout, then well, it's better than nothing. Um, and actually, this is also seen when you look at something like the uh, early German ships, the early German dreadnoughts, the things like the Nassau class. One of the reasons for that very inefficient hexagonal layout where you end up carrying 12 guns for an 8-gun broadside is because they're still using vertical triple expansion engines and so far too much real estate in the centre line, in the centre of the ship is taken up to allow for um, four and a half super firing turrets, for example, um, or amidships turrets, as in some of the British ships uh, later on down the line. So, yeah, that's, that's why those broadside broadside open mount turret or casement guns are in this in a relatively inefficient layout it basically comes down to you the engines are taking up the space that you'd otherwise put the guns in the middle bk jong i think um asks if you could cancel any five warships in history which would you choose now this is actually a difficult one because we're operating with the benefit of hindsight um, and quite a lot of the ships that you might immediately look at and go, that's absolutely awful, um, actually ended up 
teaching people very important lessons that would probably end up just being taught by another disastrously designed ship further down the line. Um, so, for example, um, something like the Vasa. Yeah, it did practically nothing other than roll over in sync. However, it did rather educate the Swedes and, well, everybody else who was uh, in the vicinity and was taking notice of the idea that m maybe you shouldn't build your ships really, really tall and thin and pack them full of heavy ordnance on top because they will just roll over and sink. Um, which is, shockingly, not a lesson that had actually been learned by that point in, in some navies. And so, yeah, you might say, well, okay, cancel the Vasa, you avoid the Vasa disaster. Well, Yes, however, inevitably someone else is going to come along and do it, um, <laughs> which uh, would probably be just as bad. Um, and similarly with Captain, you might think, oh, I'm going to cancel HMS Captain because that's an unmitigated disaster as well. Yes, very true, it was. Um, however, at the same time, it also t gave the Royal Navy the ammunition to then basically shut down any and all attempts to get a privately designed ship built and ordered for the Navy um, without their approval. And again, if, if Captain itself hadn't happened, then that kind of uh, public pressure would probably have come along further down the line. And okay, maybe it would still have happened in the Ironclad era or the early pre-Dreadnought era, and they would have learned the lesson then, and it would have just been another footnote in history, but it could have just kept going on into something relatively vital like the Dreadnought era, at which point having a class of ships that are fundamentally terrible in design, um, and yes, I know people are going to point out to the Invincibles, but worse even than that, um, I no redeeming features whatsoever, um, that's going to that could end incredibly badly. So you might actually not want to cancel HMS Captain. So I've talked about why it's ships I, you might think are obvious that I wouldn't cancel, even though um, on first glance you might think you should. In terms of ships I would cancel, um, the High Seas Fleet SMS Blucher would definitely be one. Um, I... As well, as was covered in the video on the Blucher, the poor thing was basically stuck in completely the wrong place at completely the wrong time and mainly served as a Royal Navy XP pinata. So, yeah, that's definitely one to cancel, um, given that that might allow sort of a proto Vondair tan instead, which would be better for the high seas fleet. Um, and I know this one might offend an awful lot of people. But I would actually cancel HMS Hood, um, believe it or not. Basically because of what she was, um, obviously then attracting all the fame and the glory without actually being able to get a refit and then ending up getting blown up. Shocking as it might sound, if you cancel Hood, that's an awful lot of A, that's an awful lot of tonnage freed up for the Royal Navy, um, which means they could... Uh, retain um, other vessels or improve other vessels um, but also without HMS Hood being a relatively modern fast capital ship around at the time of the Washington Naval Treaty the Royal Navy could probably swing for maybe getting three Nelsons or something along those lines um, I mean yeah, I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, um, possibly even extending that to Renown and Repulse, and I absolutely hate saying that because I love the Renown, especially in her post-refit uh, configuration, but if Renown, Repulse and Hood were cancelled, then the well, there'd be an awful lot more need for modern capital ship tonnage, which might force then force the Royal Navy to build something um, that would be a lot more useful in a lot of in a lot of ways in the Second World War, um, and again, and free up some tonnage. Uh, but it also might—I mean, it might even see them build instead two, two or three of the actual Admiral class. If you just if you put uh, Renown Repulse and Hood on on ice, which were would have been significantly more capable and also homogeneous squadron which, again, would have put the Royal Navy in a much better place going into World War II, even if they're not able to shake loose a third Nelson from the treaty, because, well, they got 
two or three admirals floating around instead of Hood, Renown and Repulse. So yeah, much as it breaks my heart to say it, um, Repulse, Renown and Hood, uh, I don't know if that counts as uh, three ships or two from because it's two classes. Um, ah, yes, I would also cancel the Königsbergs, uh, the German light cruisers. Um, yes, def definitely cancel those because, well, assuming you're trying to do the Kriegsmarine a favour, ships that you can't meaningfully send out into rough waters because you're afraid they might break, probably not a good idea. So if you cancel them and basically force them back to the drawing board, they might actually be forced to come up with something that is slightly less fragile um, and therefore a somewhat more useful combatant. Um, so yeah, if we're going by classes, then Renown class, Hood, Cla well, Hood, um, Konigsbergs and Blucher, so that leaves one more choice. And I think my final candidate would probably be USS Galena. Um, there is nothing useful, I mean, as I said, don't cancel ships that would teach a useful lesson, but there's nothing really useful to be learned from um, Galena, other than definitely not how to build an ironclad. Um, but the thing is, the US did know how to build at least coastal ironclads at the time. They built the monitors, they built the USS New Ironsides pretty much simultaneously with Galena. They could do it, and yeah, all Galena really did was provide a, an opportunity for some Confederate gunners to up their kill count. So yeah, cancel that thing. Bit of an embarrassment, really. Tommaso Balconi asks, uh, someone's asked me to, well, that's him, to make a model of the H-44 class battleship. And I was wondering, um, in the video on the Z plan, the H class, you said they had protective skegs for the propellers, but from the only plans I can find online, looks like the skegs in the later ships were very close to the center line, not enclosing uh, the full propeller shaft. Why was this the case? And does it make sense compared to the more classical skegs? Well, is a couple of things. I mean, one is, the plans online vary, shall we say, in quality and realism. Uh, this is one I pulled up for H39, um, but it gives the general idea. Um, albeit that H42 and onwards, the, the skegs were a lot more pronounced. Um, it's background image anyway. Um, so yes, <laughs> the reasons why the skegs were closer to the center line and didn't completely enclose the propeller shaft as compared to some of the more classical ones, like basically what you see on a lot of US ships, uh, as a very good example um, from the period, is twofold. One is the Germans were still going with the three propeller system, which means that the outer propeller shafts are much closer into the hull, um, which in turn means that the propeller shaft itself can be enclosed in the hull uh, for considerably longer, Thus, the skeg does not have to be as large or as obvious as compared to a four-shaft propulsion system. Um, and for those of you wondering what on earth a skeg is, um, it's basically a, an enclosure, bulge, or other such similar system which extends out of the hull to enclose and protect the propeller shaft. You know, obviously, in this case, from damage, because, well, when they were doing the H-42 design, they were rather conscious of uh, H41, H42 design, they were rather conscious of what happened to Bismarck and uh, were rather determined to try and prevent that. Um, now, the other reason, uh, apart from just the sheer location of the shafts, that the skegs look somewhat different to the more classical ones that you see quite often on uh, the US battleships is that for the German designs, the skegs were near enough as makes no difference purely about protecting. Uh, as much of the propeller shaft as was reasonably practicable without ruining the water flow of the propellers. And that calls for a certain kind of design. Whereas the skegs on the American ships were there in part to protect the propeller shafts but were, and support them, to be perfectly honest, um, but they were also there as much, um, at, as much as they were there for protection, they were there also to facilitate the hydrodynamics of the hull itself to get the speed up. Um, so a significant portion of how those uh, skegs were designed um, was influenced by this need to improve water flow around the hull of the ship uh, in such a way that they could get th uh, that they could get up to the speeds that they desired. Um, and so this is 
one of the reasons is why well one of the major reasons why um the more classic american style skeggs look very different to what the germans had planned and to skeggs installed on other ships as well um, because what you want to alter your hull's hydrodynamic properties versus what you want to protect your propeller shaft is uh, a bit of a sliding scale with that said in terms of accurate drawings if you do uh still i mean admittedly this was a question that posted about two months ago but if you're still out there tomaso and le listening to this and you want something approaching a reasonable reasonably reliable diagram of what those skegs might have looked like um do drop me a line uh ideally by discord possibly by email and i will grab a couple of scans out of Doolin and garski's book for you um and see if i've got any other books on german battleships that might similarly have some vaguely reliable diagrams and pop those over to you so you can at least have some idea of what they uh, reliably might have looked like nathaniel pool asks speaking of pre-dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts why did the major powers scrap most of their old warships instead of selling them off i'm sure they could have gotten more money selling them to various nations and then in turn selling them the shells and the spare parts and the spare gun barrels and technical expertise to fix them all rather than selling them to scrapyards uh, was it that nobody was looking to buy um well during the period when everyone was looking to buy it was very much a prestige thing to have the latest and greatest i mean if you look at the designs of well almost every ship that was being built for a quote-unquote minor power so um, Minas Gerais, um, Almarante La Torre, Rivadavia, um, the ship that would eventually become HMS Erin, um, which was the ship the Ottomans actually ordered as opposed to the one they bought from Brazil, which became Agincourt, um, the Salamis as well. When you look at the, the period in which they are designed, as opposed to maybe necessarily the period when they were delivered, um, they're actually one of, if not the most powerful warships in the world, because as this is as much about prestige as it is about actual practical national defense albeit that having the most powerful warship in the world at least for the next five minutes does give you a fair degree of ability to defend um so yeah they th at that point most powers are not going to it be accepting worn out cast offs um basically unless they absolutely have no choice and there aren't that many of those. And then once World War One is over and the various major powers are going into full scrapping mode, the, the main reason there is, one, well, a lot of economies have tanked, so they just don't have the money. Um, but also, once you got to the Washington Naval Treaty period, the treaty very specifically wrote in a whole bunch of clauses to prevent that in large part. Um, specifically because the various signatories to the Washington Naval Treaty were particularly concerned that various naval powers might quote-unquote sell a warship or two or seven to a quote-unquote foreign nation who just so happened to be really friendly with them and then in the time of war, despite that nation um, theoretically abiding by the treaty, they might magically suddenly find that all these friendly nations that they've sold warships to might spontaneously show up on their doorstep with fleets of warships and be prepared to loan or um, sell or otherwise subordinate those uh, fleets of ships to the signatory major power, which then puts the power that they're at war against in something of a pickle and yes pretty much everyone who was signing this was looking at britain and going don't even think about it because whilst japan and the united states did have some colonies much as i hate to say it, no one was going to be particularly terrified of the philippine navy um, because the Philippines just did not have the economy, industry, or really expertise to maintain anything particularly substantial. And, well, the less said about how Japan treated the places they've colonised, the better, if you want to sleep well at night. Whereas for the British, they had places like Australia and Canada and South Africa and New Zealand 
and even to a certain extent um, other colonies as well, um, like say Malaya, um, that had paid for a ship, who to varying degrees was still under some form of control or heavy influence um, by the British Empire. And there was there was a genuine concern that the Royal Navy might just start divvying up some of its older but still relatively useful ships, like, say, some of the earlier 13.5-inch gun um, dreadnoughts and the Lion and Princess Royal, um, for example. They might just sell them to Canada or Australia or whatever, and then if they ended up at war with the United States or Japan they'd just show up with them anyway, at which point, what are you going to do about it? If, you, if you're at war with a country, pointing to the fact they broke a naval treaty on a technicality is probably the least of your concerns at that point. Um, so yes, that that is, that's why they weren't allowed to sell their old ships to various, uh, various countries. The British might have been good at rules lawyering, but everyone else had pretty much caught on by the Washington Naval Treaty. Um, albeit the British, while everyone was worried about that, did manage to pull off the whole water is not armour thing. Lol, we're putting water as armour in the Nelson class, but there you go. Guido R. asks, Why is the aft turret on the Latoria class mounted so high? It seems the elevated barbette would cause unnecessary weight. Well, yes, having a, a barbette that was effectively a super-firing barbette without a super-firing turret underneath it did add weight and obviously um, would affect the stability of the ship. But as you can see from this diagram, the primary reason for elevating the turret um, on the aft of the Latoria design was for the arc of fire. Because, well, you can see where the secondary turrets are in the superstructure. If that turret was at main deck level then its arc of fire would be significantly more restricted. And indeed, if you look at the arcs of fire on the rear turrets on any number of World War II era battleships, you'll see that practically none of them have this level of firing arc for their aft turret. So this was a trade-off that the Italians thought about, and they accepted the additional weight and the potential effects on stability that they'd have to compensate for elsewhere in the design in exchange for having this uh, aft turret elevated to a point that it could actually fire forward at quite impressive degrees of angling, uh, to be perfectly honest, which would obviously allow the ship to maintain a full broadside level of fire whilst closing at a relatively shallow bearing, um, which of course would assist the ship in closing a lot faster um, and obviously narrowing its target profile as well. Spooky Shadowhawk asks, was the poor quality of inconsistent weights of the powder and shells for the Latorios due to the artisan man manner of Italian manufacturing or sabotage from the Royalist faction? Um, well, Royalist sabotage, I wouldn't know, um, <laughs> specifically. Um, the thing is, the Italians were perfectly capable of manufacturing shells and charges that were exactly to spec to give the ships um, a nice accurate patterns of fire, as the shells and charges obviously did show up in some battles. However, um, I think it's more of a case of effectively give someone an inch and they'll take a mile. Now, some of you might have heard the saying that it takes 5% of the effort to get something that's 95% perfect, and then it takes the other 95% of the effort to finish off that last 5%, um, or some saying to that effect. And broadly speaking, it is true, especially in the World War II era. Now, the thing is, there are certain things where putting in 5% of the effort and resources to get something that's 95% perfect is perfectly fine. Something like your basic hammer or your nails and this kind of thing, sort of maybe plates and such. No one's going to be particularly distressed if your plate isn't perfectly circular unless you've got really crippling OCD. Um, but when it comes to things like heavy naval shells and uh, char and the charges that propel them, that's when you really, really do want to put in absolutely everything. I mean, that that's along with things like your, that's in, say, in modern parlance, your nuclear reactors. You... Yeah, you definitely want to be putting in every single speck of effort to get that thing 100% perfect because the alternative is disastrous. Um, 
And yeah, the, the Italian tolerances, as far as the sources I've been able to dig up can tell, were plus or minus 1% and um, on, on weight, as I said in the video. And it doesn't sound like that much. But when you think about the actual shell weights and charges involved, um, well, at that point, you're talking about not far short of 900 kilos or just over 1900 pounds for the AP projectile. And with regards to the, the actual propellant charge, you're talking about 222.2 um, kilograms or 490 pounds for the propellant charge. When you start looking at that, plus or minus 1% suddenly starts to make a lot of difference. I mean, for the propellant charge, plus or minus 1% is, is roughly just over two kilos of explosive. Now, I don't know about you, but two kilos of explosive is a fair bit of boom. Um, it might not seem like much compared to nearly a quarter a ton of boom, but multiplied up by several thousand yards and the fact that you're pushing a, a, a near ton weight shell that much boom plus or minus so you're talking about possible variants of almost five kilos of boom that's going to make a fair bit of a difference and when you go up to the projectile itself um plus or minus one percent well that's plus or minus almost 20 kilos of weight so you could end up in sort of worst case scenarios where you've got one gun that's firing a shell that's almost 20 kilos lighter than the shell that's being fired in the gun adjacent but is using F almost five more kilos of explosive to do so um so uh compared to, as i say compared to the shell in the, the and charging the other barrel so that's going to have a huge impact at the other end of things um and so yeah if you set those margins at that at that sort of give or take then people are just going to go to that because well at the end of the day if you're manhandling a charge that weighs near, well, it comes in separate bags, but overall weighs almost a quarter of a ton, you might not necessarily notice the difference of a kilo or two if you're um, just trying to get them produced and out the door. But this is this is where putting in that last bit of extra effort when you when you're put uh, totting it all up and you realise, well, hang on a minute. You've got the six, say, for the charges, you've got six bags full of explosive, and maybe each one is off by a few hundred grams. You might go, oh, it'll even out in the end, when actually it won't. Um, but opening up the bag to add just a few hundred grams extra explosive, that might seem like too much like hard work. Um, this is why tolerances are a thing. Um, and the Italians, at least when they weren't being directly inspected, um, the ammunition and charge manufacturers seem to have been a little bit lax. Blue Marlin 81 asks, if some of the Lexingtons had been completed as battle cruisers, could they have been up armoured to make them effective combat units against something like a Scharnhorst or a Congo? Um, another two to three inches of armour, for example, would have given them the same level of protect protection as Renown or Repulse, uh, which seemed to be effective as long as they didn't go up against a full-scale battleship but would their narrow hull accommodate the extra armour, and would it have dragged their speed below 30 knots? Now, this is a bit of an interesting one, because the Lexingtons were, of course, designed to go to absurd speed, and uh, sadly for all concerned, by the time their final iteration of design came out, the uh, all-the-funnels approach had disappeared. However, if they'd gone into a refit and modernisation, then, in theory, you might actually have gotten semi-decent ship out of them in terms of sort of the scenario you're talking about because well their machinery spaces were absolutely colossal and they were designed as we said for very very high speeds the u.s in particular as we've discussed actually relatively recently were able to achieve reliable high pressure boilers um ahead of well basically everybody else so if we want to target a real sweet spot and say the Lexingtons go in for refits in, say, I don't know, 1938, um, by the time they've been stripped down and everything, chances are there's probably some decent high pressure machinery floating around, which compared to the early 1920s machinery they'd have on board would be massively more efficient in terms of space. So you'd be saving an awful lot of weight and be able to put in as much if not more power um 
and still have weight and space left over which is probably a good thing considering the anti-aircraft arm upgrades and such like that they would need um but with that that may well have provided enough for um, some upgraded armor quite where they'd get the upgraded armor i'm not entirely sure they probably have to manufacture it from new which would be relatively expensive um but if they did that you you could probably stick a reasonably decent amount of armor on it and with the i say with the advances in machinery i don't think their speed would go below 30 knots they'd probably lose some speed given the weight of armor that you would have to add to the lexingtons um, even if you stuck more power in, um, and possibly even torpedo protection measures and such like. But you could certainly play around with things like obviously removing the secondary battery, putting in some 5-inch 38s and st such like. Um, I'd have to run the numbers to be more precise, but I think you probably could get at least some decent level of armour out of it. Um, fighting a Sean Horst... Mm, um, possible uh i mean the the 16 inch 50 guns are going to be quite the threat to shan horse armor um but at the same time if you've if you've achieved something like say 9 to 11 inches of armor at the kind of ranges you're probably going to end up fighting shan horse its 11 inch guns might be a, something of a threat um although uh, with the with the sheer damage output of those 16 inch 50s i probably give the advantage to the refit lexington um against a congo <laughs> oh that would be fun uh, you can't run you can't hide big daddy lexington's coming to find you um i think would pretty much be the order of the day because yeah uh, the u.s would almost certainly make sure the lexington could match or exceed the speed of the congos at which point yeah it's going to run them down and if they've got broadly similar or the lexington maybe has a slight edge in armor um yeah Early were well, the first generation 16 inch 50 caliber 16 inch guns versus uh Congo's 14 inch. I I think I know where I'm putting my money um on that, so yeah, it, it, it's certainly possible. It might be an interesting thing to run some exercise, uh, some mathematical exercises on to try and work out exactly what the specs would be, realistically speaking. Kevin McTaggart asks. If naval ships are double-hulled, similar to how cargo ships are these days, or if their armour protection counts as one of these hulls, and also what happens to torpedoes if they're fired in a gale? Do they explode between waves, or do they just surf around? With torpedoes fired in a gale or a storm, it depends partially on how you're firing the torpedo and partially on how bad the waves are. So if you're firing in a gale and your torpedo tubes are above water as seen here probably something bad is going to happen because the torpedo will be launched unless you're really 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 lucky and precise at an angle that you don't necessarily know so you might end up firing it almost straight down into the sea you might fire at the appropriate angle it might fire in a massive ballistic arc and land a lot further away than you thought um which is obviously going to have all sorts of weird and wonderful effects on the torpedo um, in the form of just the impact and especially if a wave is coming towards it and then it's actually got to establish its depth and that's where the issues coincide with torpedoes fired from underwater torpedo tubes and that is specifically when we're talking about world war one world war two period torpedoes ran at a fixed depth that was set by um, a variety of devices including gyros and a, a pressure monitor and the problem there is that the depth that they have to run at, which is necessar necessarily somewhat shallow in order to ensure they actually hit the side of a ship instead of go under it, is well within the zone where the sea's pressure is affected by the waves running up and over, over it. So a torpedo that's fired in high seas at least in World War One or World War Two, will duck, dive, dip, and weave depending on what the uh, pressure it detects um, from above is. So obviously, if, the, if a big wave comes over, the torpedo is going to think, "Oh, I'm too, I'm too shallow. I'm too deep. Sorry," and it's going to try and run shallow. 
And if it the, when the trough passes over, then all of a sudden the torpedo's thinking, ah, oh, no, actually, now I'm, I'm too close to the surface, I need to dive. So the torpedo's going to start porpoising, plus obviously the um, force of the, the waves exerts a, a current effect which can knock the torpedo around. So in two higher seas, A, there's a chance the torpedo will miss because it might be diving um, unnecessarily, but also this kind of violent movement can actually throw off the gyros that guide the torpedo um, and then it'll just go randomly out of control. Nowadays, torpedoes can run much deeper than that and then pop up for the attack, so they're less vulnerable to this kind of thing. In terms of ships being double-hulled, no, warships in World War I and World War II weren't double-hulled. Um, they were often double-bottomed, or more. Um, the key difference here is that um, a single-bottomed ship is basically the ship has the outside skin, which is theoretically waterproof, um, and the underside, which again is theoretically waterproof, although nothing's perfect. Um, a double bottom is where you have two layers on the underside of the ship of plating, both of which are theoretically waterproof. Um, and the difference between that and double hull is on a double hull, as you can see, the entire hull is effectively replicated inside the outer hull. So the ship, in theory, can suffer a breach anywhere on its hull, um, and as long as the breach doesn't go too deep, the inner part of the ship will still remain watertight. Whereas with the double bottom, you can poke holes in the side of the ship and let water in ease relatively easily, although obviously warships are armoured to prevent that, um, but the bottom is uh, protected by this double layer. So, yeah, World War One, World War Two ships, etc., not double hulled, very often double bottomed, and in fact, in a number of cases for protection against things like mines and torpedoes, you would have triple or even quadruple bottomed ships, um, and technically you can even increase that layering more so if you count the torpedo defense systems as part of the hull, because quite often the torpedo defense systems were made up of multiple layers of um, waterproof, theoretically, um, plating, as well as obviously gaps and voids and such. So if you counted all of those towards uh, how many layers the ship had, it might actually go up even more than that, and depending on the ship. George Armatas asks, why did Soviet ships have green and reddish-brown decks? Was it for aerial recognition or something else? Now, the answer to this one is relatively prosaic. It's simply that when it comes to painting ships, especially their decks, when you've got metal decks, and you're at sea, you apply a coat of anti-rust paint. Um, the Russian anti-rust paint tends, a lot of the time, uh, at least it used to tend to be, uh, red lead paint, which is fairly toxic, and most people discourage its use nowadays, but other colours are available. Um, now, the difference is in a lot of Western navies, once you'd put down your anti-corrosion paint, you'd often put a layer of grey paint over, and if it was something like a helipad, you might put some anti-skid paint down as well. Uh, the Russians kind of looked at that and went, well, that's just a pointless waste of time because when you have to repaint it, we're going to have to scrape off all the grey and we're going to be fighting at extremely long ranges anyway. So the, chance, the, the fact that someone can see the red a bit more easily than the grey is hardly going to make a difference. Um, so we're just going to leave it red um, or green. Um, and then when it needs repainting, you just break out a can of paint and put some more paint on it. Um, the kind of uh, basic practicality that the Russian Navy uh, occasionally shows when they're not setting fire to their carriers. Admiral Tiberius asks, if Yamato had been able to make it close to Okinawa because of, say, a massive storm front preventing air attack, and the US Navy decides to put a gun line out to pound it into scrap steel, which is something we've covered before, do you think the British would try and get one of the KGVs involved, the King George V? Um, in order to avenge the Prince of Wales and give the King George V class the triple crown, as it were, adding to uh, Bismarck and Scharnhorst. So, as you can see from the map of where the Japanese were going at the time that you know, they were intercepted, it seems most likely that they were probably going to try and beach themselves on the western side of Okinawa. Um, I mean, they could have tried to cut back through the islands, but... It seems a little bit pointless given that otherwise they could have just proceeded near enough sort of south by southwest um, and potentially run over a few of US ships on the way rather than doing this loop manoeuvre. But anyway, um, assuming that they wind up somewhere off western, the western air side of Okinawa uh, riding in on some kind of cyclone or something that makes it 
in, or typhoon, I guess, in that area, um, that makes it impossible for air operations to work. The interesting thing is the US ships are actually based mostly off the eastern side of Okinawa, and you can see there the carriers where they advanced north to launch their airstrikes, whereas the British ships are based just to the south, kind of southwest of Okinawa, off the Sakishima Islands, which technically means that the British, uh, for surface action, assuming that Yamato is somewhere off west, the western side of Okinawa, technically actually have a slightly straighter shot, um, in as much as sort of by as the crow flies, they're probably slightly further away. But the U.S. ships have to maneuver and navigate their way around the island. Um, so it's kind of a toss up as to who'd get there first, assuming that um, it was kind of a free for all. But just to put something into perspective in terms of what was present, so you had on the US side in terms of fast battleships, Wisconsin, Missouri, New Jersey, North Carolina, Washington, South Dakota, um, Massachusetts and Indiana. And then you also have the British fast battleships, King George V and Howe. Um, and then you've got basically the the laundry list of the american older ships you've got tennessee texas maryland arkansas colorado Te nevada idaho west virginia new mexico and new york um, now to be fair that last lot probably will be a little bit slower getting there and probably not necessarily the best things to try and send up against yamato although they'll probably come in as a as a second line force but even then, you've got basic almost almost the entirety of the U.S. modern fast battleship force minus one or two present, um, plus King George V and Howe. So, um, I'm I'm pretty sure the British would love to get King George V and Howe in on the action. Um, and if I was the U.S. Admiral, um, obviously, well, obviously the U.S. Admiral would probably want the the glory of taking out the. Yamato for his own, but King George V and Howe might actually serve a useful purpose in this, as because as we said, the U.S. ships are going to have to be steaming hard from the eastern side of Okinawa, so they could be coming between Yamato and its target. But um, if you send King George V and Howe up from the south dash southwest, you actually end up in a situation where they're blocking off one of Yamato's two pos possible lines of well either retreat or attack and guarding by guarding the southern flank so um yeah it's i think the british would definitely try and get involved whether or not the u.s would let them or whether they might just show up at the end and throw a few shells there yamato's way for fun who knows tree shaker tucker asks what would happen if at the start of world war one the royal navy for whatever reason didn't have access to its pre-dreadnought battleship fleet except for their guns the crews and scrap now, this actually changes quite a lot. I mean, on the relatively small scale of things, um, for example, Admiral Craddock's squadron is probably going to have to need a whole sort of different ships because he was given the old pre-dreadnought HMS Canopus, much use as it ended up being, um, to bring his squadron up a bit in terms of protection and firepower, specifically because everybody realised that on his own the squadron didn't stand much of a chance against Von Spee. And equally, um, Canopus would then actually serve a useful purpose in that by being effectively turning itself into a stationary uh, coastal defence fort, it managed to deter Von Spee from attacking the Falklands, giving the two battle cruisers enough time to get their steam up. So... Those are two scenarios that are immediately affected by the loss of the pre-dreadnoughts hulls themselves. Um, further to that, obviously, you have the whole Gallipoli campaign was largely buoyed up by pre-dreadnoughts, um, although some of them didn't really stay up. Um, then you've also got the fact that the Grand Fleet, up until probably about two years into the war, still can, had at least one or more squadrons of pre-dreadnoughts in it. Um, by the time of Jutland, it was solely dreadnoughts, but that was a relatively recent development. Um, equally, the Thames Estuary and the Channel were protected by squadrons of pre-dreadnoughts. Um, the Thames Estuary in particular had the last pre-dreadnought squadron of the Grand Fleet assigned to it in the earlier part of 1916. So 
all of those will now need protecting, which might stretch the Royal Navy's resources quite thin, especially if they start having to look at using dreadnought battleships. Um, of course, if that if that does happen, then the chances of them slowing down construction and stopping construction on various battleships on, that are currently being built is that's not going to happen. They're going to have to crash build um, everything they've got on the slips and start more. So you might see. Well, you definitely will see the eight revenge class come out, and they might even um, resurrect one or two of uh, the Queen Elizabeth that got cancelled. I mean, they'll be throwing everything they've got at trying to build new ships. Um, equally, if they've still got the guns and the crews and the scrap metal value for what that that's worth, I mean, monitors are going to have a field day. Um, they did build a, several classes of monitors that used old pre dreadnought guns, so they can do that. Um, but they might also take some of the newer weapons, uh, sort of say the guns from the Lord Nelson class, etc., and start trying to throw out some quick and easy, uh, sort of first or second generation equivalent dreadnought uh, units, just to try and make up the numbers. Because as we said in other videos, guns are the long order system. They've still got the guns, so hey ho. Um, also, with the sheer number of secondary guns around 9.2, 7.5, 6 inch, etc., um, you might find actually, ironically enough, that the uh, British artillery park on the Western Front suddenly becomes substantially more powerful because, well, they've got little else to do with most of them. So yeah, there would be quite a, quite a number of effects, and it's quite difficult to say how that would all go, but um, it, it would affect the overseas. Uh, deployment of Royal Navy forces quite significantly um, because they wouldn't have these linchpin units that basically nothing else can match um, and at the same time they would be looking at situations uh, more uh, on the home front where they need to suddenly reassign heavy assets to prevent something like uh, the, the uh, first scouting group maybe even raiding up the Thames. T.C. Green asks, of the nations that did not sign the Washington Naval Treaty, who did the best job of planning, building, and maintaining their navy in the interwar years? Well, it's an interesting question, actually, because when you look at the signatories of the Washington Naval Treaty, namely Britain, America, Japan, France, and Italy, who really is left? Um, I mean, you've got the Germans, who basically didn't do all that much for in terms of large naval construction until the mid 1930s i mean they built the the deutschlands and the Königsbergs and the nurnbergs but i don't necessarily think you can say that that's the epitome of planning building and maintaining a navy albeit they did come up with the most modern pre-dreadnought ever because they had to um obviously maintain and modernize uh Schlesen and Schleswig-Holstein. Um, you've got the Russians, who basically let a lot of their navy decay, almost to the point of uselessness for a significant portion of the earlier part of that period. Um, albeit they then, obviously, in the, again, in the 1930s, did start with the modernizations of some of their ships. Outside of that, um, you've got the Spanish, who managed to have a civil war um, and lose a couple of, well, pretty much end up losing the entire Espana class eventually. Uh, there's not really any major navies on the African continent at this point. Un um, the Ottomans are going through catastrophic collapse, so there isn't really a Turkish navy other than the, the ex-Goban. Most of the rest of the world is still colonies, with the exception in large part of South America. Um, you've got the Australian Navy and the Canadian Navy, um, which do relatively reasonably uh, decent jobs. But then whether or not you... I mean, they they are separate services, but with the amount of ships and stuff they buy from the Royal Navy, some people might consider it cheating to say one of those. Um, I mean, the, the Royal Australian Navy would be up there. Um, obviously, they didn't have a massive budget and they didn't have uh, huge capital ship fleets and such like, but they did do a relatively decent job of putting together a a small, useful cruiser-based um, force with some destroyers with things like uh, Canberra, Perth, Australia, etc., albeit they did have to give up their battle cruiser. 
And ultimately, the thing is that um, a lot of navies were hit really badly by the Great Depression. I mean, pretty much everyone. If you're going to go for completely independent navies that largely went into World War II reasonably capable um, compared to how they went you know, through the Washington Naval Treaty period, I think probably you'd have to go with the Chileans um because the, well the brazilian battleships were pretty much broken the river davias weren't that far behind um but whilst there was some severe economic issues in the early 1930s and whilst it wasn't modernized the almirante la torre um chile's battleship and its uh associated ships were at least still operational <laughs> um at the by the start of world war Two, which is a lot more than could be said for a, a lot of navies world war one era assets um so yeah in in terms of the the, the fully independent navies i'd have to go with the chileans um i so say the the Austra royal australian navy could probably get a a good uh, leg in there as well um the russians given the sheer amount of neglect the, and the rather scattered planning they did really don't can't be counted and um I mean, the Germans were obviously building pretty much a new fleet from scratch, but again, the fact that there was relatively little done during the 1920s and some of their design choices were questionable and others were outright cheating um, probably puts them a little bit down a notch when you're talking about the best job of planning, building and maintaining their navy as opposed to the overall outcome in terms of sheer firepower. And that brings this episode of The Dry Dock to an end. So thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope to see you again in another video.